I will attempt to place field experiments and lab experiments within cross-sectional, reduced form, and, and structural approaches to start. Then I will talk about the types of field experiments that have arisen in economics. And I will talk about how these field experiments have been used to think about testing theory for uh, speaking to policymakers, et cetera. And from there, I, I don't want you to leave here without having a few thoughts about design. So if you would go out tomorrow and run an experiment, I want you to have a few things in the back of your mind about how you would design your experiment. Okay, so I'll probably end this morning with a few design insights. And this afternoon, I will bring forward something I call opening my laptop, which will include several examples of the different types of field experiments that I'll talk about this morning. Okay, I'll, I'll break down the types of field experiments into something called an artifactual field experiment, a framed field experiment, and a natural field experiment. And along the way here, please ask any questions if you have them. I don't want this to turn into a University of Chicago seminar. Um, I'll, I'll only get through three or four slides if we do that. But by all means, please ask a clarifying question or if I say something that you don't agree with, just call me on it and we can discuss it. Okay? So let's get started. So in light of the fact that the last few methods lectures have been about things like reduced form models and structural models, I, I, I've been thinking about how to place generation of data into some sort of schematic. And the way I think about it is on the one end, we have ways of modeling interesting data or ways to look at naturally occurring data. And of course, we have a lot of different methods over here, which, which we've been playing around with for years. And, and when you step back, the simple goal here is to create the proper counterfactual. Now, all of these approaches have different ways to create the proper counterfactual. And we debate whether the assumptions that we make using these approaches are, are valid or not. But essentially, the, the crux of it is we cannot observe the proper counterfactual, so we have to develop a technique to construct that proper counterfactual to estimate a treatment effect. Okay, now on the other end of the extreme, we have something that has arisen in the last several decades called lab laboratory experimentation. Okay, now here, obviously the most important assumption for most lab experiments is that you have proper randomization. This is your identification assumption whenever you're dealing with these types of experiments, or most of the experiments, is that they're using randomization as their instrumental variable. Okay, once you have proper randomization and a proper sample size, this is of course what gives you the proper counterfactual. Now lab experiments have been around for a long time. The way I look at it, I've traced um, experiments in economics all the way back to Daniel Bernoulli, who ran uh, essentially the most famous St. Petersburg paradox experiments back in 1738. And interestingly, his resolution to the St. Petersburg paradox was something that looked a lot like expected utility theory. Okay, from there you can trace economic experiments to Thurston, which was published in the Journal of Social Psychology. And here, he's essentially trying to construct indifference curves in this 1931 paper. Now, within the economics literature, the first real market experiment that was published was actually published in the JPE in 1948. And it was written by Chamberlain, not by Vernon Smith. Vernon Smith gets a lot of credit for being the first to run market experiments. But Vernon Smith was actually a student of Chamberlain's, and he was a subject in these experiments. Um, that's, of course, what motivated Vernon to think harder about running market experiments. It was Chamberlain's market experiments, which he ran in the mid-40s, which were eventually published in the JPE. Now, Nash, of course, ran a lot of two-by-two -two simple experiments as well, testing his uh, theories of games. Okay? Now, it's clear, however, that the experimental method did not really uh, pick up very quickly within the economics literature. 
And what I have here, I have a number of publications on the y-axis, and I have time here. You, know, you have Chamberlain back in here. Vernon Smith published two seminal papers in the JPE in 1962 and 1965. Charlie Plott came in around here, but there still was not a lot of action within the economics literature until around the 70s and 80s when all of a sudden we have this explosion of research using the laboratory experimental method. Now I've updated this and partly refined it in this particular time series and what this shows is the number of experimental publications in top 15 journals from 1948 to 2006. And as you can see where 98 left off we have a huge increase in the number of publications within economics. There's only one major journal that has not followed this path. Derek, can you name that journal? <laughs> the very journal that was publishing Chamberlain's work and Smith's work, the JPE is the only journal that has not followed this particular path um, in publishing lab experiments. But the JPE has been extremely sympathetic to field experiments. Okay. So all seems well, and maybe we should just stop with lab experiments. You should say, you say wrong, so. Is that right? Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> Major, top four. Apologize for that, Jolly. Um, now. What hit home for me when I was working at the Council of Economic Advisors was, you know, I, I do a lot of laboratory experiments myself. And I was arguing that when we revise the benefit cost guidelines, we should be taking account of the results from Kahneman, Tversky, and Thaler on the endowment effect. We should be thinking hard about why willingness to accept is five to ten times larger than willingness to pay and think about using that fact within, benefit co within the benefit cost guidelines. Okay, and this is a verbatim quote from, I can't tell you his name, but it's fair to say he was a top-ranking White House official. Even though these results appear prevalent, they are suspiciously drawn by methods similar to scientific numerology because of students who are not real people. <laughs> okay, now whenever I present lab work, this is the first line of defense that you give me. Look, John, these are students. It's, they're just playing around. They're not real people. It's exactly what the White House thought uh, back in 2002 as well. Now, there are more criticisms than just the representativeness of the population. So there was a discussion, a brief discussion in 1980, which was begun by Cross, who notes it seems to be extraordinarily optimistic to assume that behavior in an artificially constructed market game would provide direct insights into actual market behavior. He's taking a shot at what Vernon's working on throughout the 60s and 70s. And a, sta a broad statement like that makes you step back and say, well, what exactly are the differences between that environment, that particular domain, and the domain of, of interest to theoreticians and empiricists? Of course, a commodity, the stakes, the environment, et cetera, might be different. Now, Vernon responds to this in his AER paper saying, sometimes experiments are criticized. You know, people suggest that there are differences between lab and field behavior. But so far to date, there, there's no data to show that. So therefore, the criticism is pure speculation. This is about where we are still in the economics literature. We're, we're, we're gathering data in part via field experiments to help to inform this particular debate about the generalizability between uh, lab behavior and other markets. Okay? So I argue that one important component of field experiments will, by necessity, be this idea to answer the first order question, does behavior in the lab generalize to behavior in the field? Okay, so now, now we go to field experiments, and let's step back and think about some of the early field experiments. And I've just written a paper about the three, what I call the three major waves of field experimentation. And I'm defining field very broadly, as you'll see what I, in this first particular wave, which I'm calling the dawn of field experiments. This is a paper with Steve Levitt that was just published in the European Economic Review. 
we call the Donna Field experiments literally the manure experiments that Nyman and Fisher were running in the teens and the 20s. Okay, they, they were literally in the field randomizing different manure types over plots of land. But interestingly enough, this has had profound implications for not only lab and field experiments in economics, but uh, experimental methods throughout the sciences. Why? Because through this, Fisher developed what's called the tripod of experimentation, where he put forth randomization, block design, and replication as three of the important factors that lead to a appropriate conditions for good statistical analysis. Okay, this was essentially laid out in the 20s by Fisher and Nyman. Now, what we call the second wave of field experiments would be the wave of social experiments. Who do you think should get credit for being an, an early pioneer of social experiments? In economics, not, not in life more generally. Any guesses? It's a person who received her PhD from MIT. And she's currently working at Resources for the Future. Heather Ross. So Heather Ross was instrumental in running the early social experiments that were testing Friedman's proposed negative income tax. At the time, these experiments cost roughly $5 million. So I think it's fair to say that this could have been one of the most expensive doctoral dissertations in economics still today. Um, at right around the same time in Europe, there were some electricity pricing schemes in Great Britain that were, were being executed that would fall under the guise of a social experiment. Now, social experiments have not only led to some, some very interesting policy results, which I think of the development experiments that, that Michael will be talking about later is, is a kind of social experiment, and I'll be calling all of these framed field experiments in a minute. But of course, they, they presented some really new and interesting questions as well. For example, plots of land cannot excuse themselves from treatment, and they cannot select into treatment. So this gets at the selection issue that, that Heckman ha has taken on. Now, and, and others, of course, have taken on. Now, more broadly, this, this issue touches off this debate, which some people tell me there's a debate between structural econometricians and experimental advocates. Uh, being at the University of Chicago, I don't see that debate because we all agree, but some people say that, that there's a debate between these types of, of researchers. Now, the, the third wave, which I'm arguing that we're in right now, are the more recent field experiments, and this is what Harrison and I, when we came up with this uh, classification of types of field experiments. So we can think about the lab is being a very sterile, controlled environment where sometimes we use randomization to achieve identification. Some lab experiments don't. Recall that most of Vernon Smith's experiments do not use randomization to achieve identification. They're called experiments because he has control. Okay. So what we call a, an artifactual field experiment is something that I don't really consider a field experiment at all. But nonetheless, it's an important step from the laboratory environment in that a lot of people believe that representativeness of the population is an important variable when thinking about generalizing behavior. So we call an artifactual field experiment one where it's identical to a lab experiment, but it's using a non-standard subject pool. Okay, so if that's the only problem with the lab method, then the lab method is not in, in any trouble at all, frankly because it's not very hard to go out and recruit farmers, to go out and recruit CEOs, to go out and recruit Chicago board uh, options traders and stock traders. I've done all of those things myself. It's not that hard to recruit those types and bring them into the lab. Okay. Now the next step in this uh, new wave of field experiments we uh, categorized is, go ahead. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Essentially, it's blocking on a characteristic and then randomizing over that characteristic. So you'd put 
you'd block on, you'd say women, and then I'd say I want half women in treatment and half in control. That's what a block design is. In, in, um, it, you can compare that to uh, a factorial design where you're just randomizing each person coming in. Um, a factorial design, then you might not get the variation in women or in men or in, in, uh, in any other characteristic that you're interested in. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. That's a good question, though. Okay, we denoted a framed field experiment as one whereby you begin to add naturalness in the environment, such as the stakes are the same as the environment that you're thinking about, the, the information is the same, the task is the same, the commodity is the same, the timeline is the same. However, people still know that they're taking part in an experiment. Importantly, they're still signing consent forms. They're still selecting into an environment in which they know that their behavior will be scrutinized. Okay? Now, what I think of as the final frontier in this experimental wave is what we denote as a natural field experiment. And this is going to an environment, randomizing within that environment without anyone knowing that there's an experiment going on. So they're acting in their environment as naturally as possible, of course, by definition. But yet the experimenter is going into that environment, overlaying perhaps a randomization, and that's how the experimenter is achieving identification by looking at treatment and control, for example. So now you have randomization, which is the beauty behind experimentation, and you have realism. By definition, you're doing the randomization in an environment where no one even knows that they're taking part in an experiment. I think I consider this the best of both worlds. Now, it's not always possible to run a natural field experiment on a lot of the interesting and important economic questions that we can think about. So where I depart from my experimental colleagues is I don't think lab and field experiments can answer every question that we face as a society. But it can answer a lot of interesting questions. Okay? Any questions about this classification scheme? Yes? Sure. Uh, and if I don't, please bring that up. Um, by and large, a lot of, even though I have IRB approval for all of my natural field experiments, I'm beginning to learn that a lot of it is IRB exempt. Um, but we can discuss that later. And I've written a little bit on consent in social experiments, uh, a few recent science papers where there's a, there's a give and take. Because that's, when I wrote this paper for science, a letter was written back into science saying, List uh, gleefully says natural field experiments are great, and, and the fellow says, What happened to informed consent? Um, so then I had to write a, a long response back. But um, we, can, we can talk about that later. Any other questions on this? Okay, good, good. So in development, the way I think about it is there are a lot of development field experiments that fall here. I'm not sure if Michael's going to talk about those, but I can talk about those this afternoon. Some fall, a lot fall here, and a few fall here. Okay? Okay, so the underlying idea now is pretty simple. We have some ways to generate our own data. We have lab, we have lab experiments, we have several different types of field experiments, and we have models that can, can look at naturally occurring data. Now the argument here is that it's worthwhile to think about sampling these environments over here, even though they're small scale field settings. Many times we can ask and answer questions over here that are impossible to answer over here, and I'll give you a few examples in a few moments. Of course, these aren't the most important markets. So then we have to think hard about how we can generalize results from over here, over here. Okay? And that's exactly what theory and further empirical testing can do for you. Okay? So what are some uses of field experiments? Now, now for me, most of the time, I'm going out trying to test theory. Either one of my own theories or a theory that's out there. Okay? But there are many other uses, of course. Measuring key parameters. If you reject a theory, collecting enough information to construct a new theory, for example. Speaking to policymakers, which Michael will talk a lot about. And most recently, I've found that field experiments can actually make firms a lot of money. 
So in, in talking about natural field experiments, I'll talk about some of my experiments with charities and with firms near the end of this afternoon. Okay? Now, it's been raised a few times, and, and naturally it, it will be raised, and that's this, these methodological questions in what I've argued is the most important question facing lab experimenters, and that's whether behavior in the lab generalizes to behavior in the field. I'm not going to talk much about these methodological considerations. Number two, I think, is a very important question facing behavioral economists. Many behavioral theories today are written based on results from the lab. To date, we have little idea what overlaying a real market setting does to those anomalies, and we have little idea about how market experience, uh, whether it diminish, attenuates or diminishes or exacerbates these anomalies. There's not a lot of empirical evidence on that. Okay, and then in general, are we making proper inference from lab and naturally occurring data? And that's exactly what Levitt and I talked about in our recent Journal of Economic Perspectives paper. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about inference. And a useful place to start is probably right at the, right at the center of the wave of behavioral economics, and that's the endowment effect. Can someone tell me about these famous endowment effect experiments, mugs and candy bars? Devin? If you're going to be here, I'm going to call you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in a series of experiments, Kahneman, Kinesh, and Thaler ran both willingness to accept and willingness to pay treatments, but they also ran trading experiments. In the trading experiments at Cornell, they would bring, uh, bring in students to sit in a classroom. They would give half of them a mug. They would give half of them a candy bar. And they told the students, if you were given a mug, would you like to trade with the experimenter your mug for a candy bar? If you were given a candy bar, you can trade with the experimenter your candy bar for a mug. What they found is that 90% of people who were given a mug kept the mug. 90% of people who were given a candy bar kept the candy bar. Okay, so they argued in a JPE paper in 1990 that this was strong evidence of an endowment effect or once you have the good in hand, you place an attachment value on it. Okay, because neoclassical theory would say if, if P percent trade the mug for the candy bar, then one minus P percent should trade the candy bar for the mug. Right? That's what neoclassical theory has a strong prediction there. So let's take that to heart and go out to a naturally occurring environment where people engage in trade. And that's exactly what this set, this set of studies did, is that it went to several small scale markets sports card markets, pin trading markets, et cetera, open air markets, et cetera. And it essentially replicated the mugs and candy bar experiments. Now, it replicated it in the sense that I have proportion that trade here. Of course, neoclassical theory, if they're equal goods, it should be 50%. And I'm binning people here, really inexperienced people, really experienced people. So it replicated it in the sense that this little bar right here, about one out of 10 people trade. So the really inexperienced people in these marketplaces look a lot like Cornell coffee mug and candy bar traders. But as you randomly give them experience or as they gain experience endogenously, the data has both, behavior approaches exactly what neoclassical theory would predict. Okay, roughly, not quite half, but nearly half of people trade their uh, randomly allocated good. Now, what does this mean? Some people have interpreted this as saying, well, that shows that the lab experiments are somehow wrong. I, I, I think that's an incorrect, that's too strong of an interpretation. I think the way to view this is that you have results from the lab, 
equally as valid results from the field. And together, these two pieces of information can lead to a, a much deeper understanding of human behavior. And of course, that's what theorists have now taken on the challenge. These various theorists, Porachenko, Kozegi, and Rabin, Chambers, etc., have taken on this challenge to try to model exactly what's going on in both the lab and the field data. Now, empirically, of course, it's important to first replicate my, my data, which thankfully these data have now been replicated several times, and to go back to the lab and think about what are the factors that attenuate or exacerbate these types of effects that I'm finding, and then go back to the field for more testing in naturally occurring environments. That's exactly the way that I envision science evolving to uh, maximize exactly what we learn using theory, lab experiments, and data from the naturally occurring world. Okay, So that's something on inference. Now another idea we can think about is, is causes. So one particularly vexing problem in some walks of research is that we observe a pattern in the data, but we're not exactly sure what are the underlying causes for that pattern. And I think the discrimination literature is a, is a good example of this. So when we observe discrimination in the real world, what are our major models for why that discrimination is occurring? I think of it as two major models. One was developed by a guy at the University of Chicago in his dissertation, and it was published in 1957. I had a t Becker's taste for discrimination. People might be discriminated against because there are bigots out there who derive utility from discriminating against them. And the other major model would be what Pigou called third degree price discrimination or statistical discrimination. Right? An entrepreneur, in her efforts to maximize her profits, discriminates against agents. Right? Under Becker's model, the entrepreneur can forego profits to cater her bigotry. Under third degree price discrimination, in an effort to maximize her profits, she's discriminating. It's very hard to parse, as you've tried, it's very hard to parse these two types of discrimination in naturally occurring data. I'm going to argue that with a series of field experiments, in the spirit of this paper in the, in the QG, one can make some headway to determine what is the major model at work. It might be a little bit of each, of course. Okay, so let's talk about that discrimination experiment. And, and this should be familiar to all of those who are familiar with the literature. This is, these are paired audit study field experiments. Okay, so what I have here to begin, I have 12 disabled agents, and these are agents in wheelchairs paired with 12 non-disabled testers who are not in wheelchairs but who are driving the identical vehicles to various repair shops in and around Chicago. Okay. Now, there are... There are dozens of, des of design decisions that you need to make when running these paired tester experiments. Whether they should have a script, whether they should both wear red baseball caps, whether they should both have hair to, to the shoulder, etc. What I'm going to argue is unless those variables importantly interact with my two treatments here, all they're affecting is the level. They're not affecting the interpretation that I'm making on what's driving the discrimination. But you can call me on that, and please do, if you don't agree with it. Okay, so they're driving identical cars to repair shops, and they're, at, they're telling the mechanic, today I would like to get my front bumper fixed. So this will not be an experiment based on the mechanic telling them there are five things wrong rather than two things wrong. That's interesting, too. But nonetheless, here we're pinpointing the front bumper needs to be fixed. Okay? Are there any questions about the general design? I know I've been very vague. Yeah. This is kind of tricky because my testers know that it's an experiment and the mechanics don't. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, 
Loosely, I've called this somewhere in the area of a framed field experiment, just because my testers do know, but they are acting in a natural environment. Yeah. It wouldn't be artifactual and natural. It would be framed or natural. Right. So I'd, I'll, just, I'll just take the, the bad one, or quote bad one, if you want to call it that. Okay? Any other questions on this? Okay, what do you think happens? Joe, what do you think? I think the disabled do better. Do better. Yeah, you could see a model like that, actually. The disabled actually receive, they do do better. They receive much higher offers. <laughs> um, but I could certainly see that the, the sympathy argument. But in our data, the disabled receive roughly 30% higher offers in the repair market. Okay. But again, you're left in the world of what does this mean? Right? So we can start begin, let's begin to chisel away at this. Because my intuition is with yours. I could have easily seen it go the other way. Um, so let's think about running a survey, which we did. Yes, go ahead, Luigi. No, you gave this, I remember, that uh, you were trying to engage it, and I wanted to show that to you. I will not let the question be so naturally as you get to the and also that says how impressed. Yeah, let's hold that and see if we can take it out with the next treatment. But I certainly agree that whenever re running these audit studies, given that the audit pair knows they might give the experimenter exactly what they think the experimenter wants to see or what they want to signal to the experimenter. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly sympathetic to that, and I think it does happen in a lot of cases. Let's see if we, if we can take that on. Maybe it does interact with treatment. Yes. Yeah, what we, what we end up doing is we choose the lowest offering body shop and we give them $350 then to go and get their car fixed with that body shop. That's to avoid deception. Um, otherwise, it's just deceiving people. So that, that that's was the incentive. Yes? Exactly. So, so the mechanic might perceive these two types to have different willingness to pay distributions. So I'm with you there, but I immediately went to the willingness to pay distributions were different based on search costs. So, so then that's where the surveys went. We surveyed disabled, and what you find is that they do search less. You survey mechanics... And they also believe that the disabled search less. So that's some evidence that this is statistical discrimination based on differences in willingness to pay distributions. Yes? Exactly. So that it goes the other way. I think here, this is, I'm just trying to show you that if you pair two field experiments, you can disentangle these. I've not written down a taste-based model, but you can see how it could work, but my initial intuition's in the other direction as well. Yes. Yes, they were actually in wheelchairs. Okay, and would, would the same given experiment would be tested for any disability by any It certainly might be, and I don't have data on that. I do have data on sexual orientation where People are feigning that, and there is a difference in, in data there. Okay, but now just looking at the survey evidence, of course, that's not strong. So what we need to do is think about new treatments that can potentially provide more insights into what's going on. Okay, so first of all, what we want to do is get a new tester type set, send those people out, and see if we can replicate our results because it was a small sample. And then we want to send out the pairs running another treatment where both agent types simply say, I'm getting a few price quotes. That's the only thing that's changed, is both disabled and non-disabled make the statement, I'm getting a few price quotes. Okay. So in the replication treatment, we get exactly the same result, albeit it's smaller. Now it's only 20%. Okay. 
difference between the disabled and non-disabled. What do you think happens on the next click? Okay, by that, by that one statement, what happens is the disabled and non-disabled, now you do see the disabled having a slightly smaller, um, off, but of course these, these, two aren't, these two aren't different, but nonetheless it's slightly smaller. Now you can see that there's no difference between the price quotes across disabled and non-disabled. So I think that gives you some evidence that what was going on is it was statistical discrimination based on a heterogeneous search cost or heterogeneous search behavior. Again, we don't have it sealed tight. You never can with just two treatments and, and not, a, not a good theory. These are still pilot experiments. But nonetheless, you can see the power of pairing two field treatments together and one being driven based on a theory that would subscribe, here's how behavior uh, should actually change going from treatment one to treatment two. Okay, so you can think of a lot better examples on black white in, in cars and across different cities that we're going there, but, but we have not gotten there yet. Okay. But I, think the, I, think, I hope what this illustrates is the power of pairing different field experimental treatments and the power of parsing the different theories that might be describing the behavior, or the motivations that might be underlying the behaviors. Yes. It was set in the design. I told the story. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay, let's move on. There's a lot to, lot to cover. Okay, let's get back to the basics. I want to give you something that you can go home with, and this is my idea that if you're going out to run an experiment tomorrow, what mistakes would I want you to avoid if you're designing your experiment? Okay. And these are common mistakes that I observe every day when I review papers or read colleagues' papers. I'm going to break this down into four, four different types. And, and Michael will be talking about intercluster correlation coefficients a little bit. So if I don't get to that, uh, that will be in my slides. And, and you, can have, you can have my slides, of course. OK, I'm going to start by saying this idea of a 0-1 treatment. You either get the pill or you don't. And we have equal outcome variances. This would be the standard neoclassical uh, t-test type of idea. Uh, letter B will be, again, 0-1 treatment. But now we have unequal outcome variances. The variance of the treatment might be double the variance of the control. What, if I suspect that, what should I do in my design? That's what, the, that's what this will answer. Letter C, treatment intensity, we're no longer in the realm of pill or no pill, we're in the realm of should we have the incentive set at 1, 3, 5, 7, or 9? And exactly how should we design our experiment if we're allowed to pick over this range? Yeah, it's interesting, an interesting uh, set of rules of thumb in that case. And then intracluster correlation coefficients are just a way to tax yourself. So the idea is if randomization occurs at the village level, but the outcomes are at the individual level, and if there's correlation across individuals, we need to essentially tax ourselves and get a, get a larger sample because of the correlation of behaviors within, the, within each village. And I'll have an example here that will show you the, the very large tax that um, you might have to impose on yourself. The idea is why not impose it on yourself before you run the experiment rather than afterwards when you have to uh, address the issue of, of independence of observations. So it's just trying to get your sample to be optimal at the very beginning. Okay? So I don't want to get caught up in this, but let's, let's start with letter A and make some standard assumptions here. Assume that the outcome of the control is distributed normally with mean, mu, naught, uh, sigma squared variance, x1 the same for the control group. I'm going to define a minimum detectable effect of delta, and that's going to be important. Okay, we have our null and alternative. Now we're going to define two things, a significance level, of course, probability of type 1 error, alpha, and this is a standard 
equation that we're all familiar with. Equation two is a, a power equation. This is something that will likely be new for most of you if you have not designed experiments. This is, of course, just one minus the probability of type two error. And that equals this. These look very familiar, and, and you should know, know why. Okay? But I want to talk a little bit about power before solving these two equations. So let's think about the standard case. The standard case is we have the null distribution here. We have the alternative distribution here. And alpha, as we know, that, that's our typical definition of alpha. Now, beta, of course, is the area of the alternative that will overlap with the area of the null, when basically we're not rejecting the null when really we should be, type 2 error. So in essence, what you have to set is you have to set alpha and beta. And you have to have a minimum detectable effect before you go out and run your experiments. OK, now power here, of course, is the area to the right of beta under the alternative distribution. That's what we call power of the test. OK, now power is interesting because I think most of our intuition stems from this typical regression model, where we think about it under a true null, what is the probability of, of observing the coefficient that we observe? That's usually where our, all of our intuition uh, comes from. But now, power is a, a little bit different. It's exploring if the alternative hypothesis is true, then what is the probability that the estimated coefficient lies outside the 95% confidence interval defined under this, you should say null, defined under the null. That's exactly what we're talking about with power. OK? Now, if you solve those two equations, and let's assume variances are equal, like I, like I mentioned, you get this simple equation. And this tells you exactly what your sample sizes should be. Right? We, have, we have the typical critical values here. This is the minimum detectable effect delta, and that's the standard deviation. Now it gives us some insights about how the necessary sample size changes with, with these variables. For example, it, it increases rapidly with the desired significance level and power. That's intuitive. And I'll show you some rules of thumb on that in a minute. It increases proportionally with the variance of the outcomes. Higher variance, optimal sample size, necessary sample size increases proportionally. Decreases inversely proportionally with the square of the minimum detectable effect size. OK, now you can see that the sample size depends on the ratio. So, so many times when I'm talking about sample size, people always ask, I'm running an experiment. How many observations should I, should I get? This tells you that. If you want to detect a one standard deviation change, this will tell you. If you want to detect a half a standard deviation change, this will tell you. A tenth of a standard deviation change, I'll give this, all this stuff on the next few slides. OK. So let's start with that. Now, I'm, I'm not going to take a stand on why convention is this way, but the convention in the literature is to set alpha equal to 0.05 and power equal to 0.8. And we all know what that means. And we all know that there will be trade-offs. OK. So as I mentioned, if you want to detect a one standard deviation change, now we have the answer. You need 15.68 observations in treatment, 15.68 observations in control. That will give you an 80% power and a significance level of 0.05. So if you just want to detect very large changes, you don't need large sample sizes. OK, likewise, half a standard deviation. Well, now I know you're getting the idea now that it's 15.68 times the standardized effect, right? So 15.68, in this case, times 4, because it's 2 over 1 squared. And now I know if I want to detect a half of a standard deviation change, I need 64 observations per cell. There seems to be a magic number in our literature where people go out and, and get 30. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite certain where magic 30 comes from, but 8 out of 10 experiments that you, um, you read about in using mostly lab data is the magic number is 30. Well, yeah. <laughs> not, not perfectly generalized over to what we're talking about, right? <laughs> Now we've learned what Derek thinks about macro, and we've learned what he thinks about ex lab experiments. <laughs> okay, what is a magic 30? Well, it's, it's 0.7 standard deviation change. That's what you can detect with 80% power. That's what magic 30 is. Nothing magical about that. Okay? And it comes simply from that, that equation. Now, here are some rules of thumb that give you an idea of how the necessary sample size, sizes change when you change type 1 and type 2 air. What I'm doing here is I'm simply changing the power from 80% to 95%, and I'm leaving the significance level the same. Necessary sample size goes up by 65%. Leave the power the same. Go to, go to a significance level 0.01. Now, Necessary sample size goes up by 49% from the baseline. Do them both, 2.27 times n, 127% increase in necessary sample size. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's clear what you're doing. You're, if the alternative is true, you're not rejecting it 20% of the time. And if you want to have more power, if you want to, want to not reject it 10% of the time, then you need a power of 0.9. Now, why this is developed, I, I can't determine why it's developed to be 0.8. Is it more effective to use the... Yes. Not a, let me say a caveated yes. Unless costs are not prohibitive. What I, what I haven't mentioned here is the cost of obtaining each observation. I'm, I'm assuming the cost and treatment and control are identical and, and let's say, reasonable enough to where we, at, we want to get a sample size that's necessary, but we have to consider costs. So I will, I will bring in costs too, but my first intuition is to go to point eight. Yes? See, what I do a lot on that is I, I will block on those observables and then that's a way to re reduce uh, residual variance, uh, which is similar to afterwards than running it through regression. I'm blocking on those up front. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk. That's a good segue to, to having unequal variances. And then I'll give an idea about how I how I get some intuition about the variances, which my answer is basically to run pilot experiments. But there's a cost, right? Each pilot I run, that, that's fewer data points for the real experiment. Um, but remember, I'm, I'm, always a, I'm always still about how many standard deviation uh, changes do I want to detect. So in that world, it's if I want to de detect a, a tenth of a standard deviation change, I know I need 1,568 observations regardless of how big the variance is. Now, that, that might beg the question of, well, well, look, if the variance is really small and you detect one-tenth of it, it's not very interesting. Um, so that, that's right. But So what I typically look at older literature or run my own pilots, and that's how I get an idea of what the variances are going to look like. Yes? That depends on the situation and uh, in the previous literature, what they have found. So if I'm in the area of education, I think a tenth of a standard deviation is a pretty, big, is a, a, a pretty reasonable change to try to detect. If I'm doing gift exchange in the field, it might be like a, a half of a standard deviation because that's where the literature seems to be. So a lot of it's driven on, on the previous literature. That's sort of something you know it when you see it, but it's it's hard to generalize across situations because many of the situations are very different. 
when you're doing pricing experiments, um, it's the same sort of thing. We have a feel for what an elasticity should look like and what a big effect would be. Yeah. Okay, now, when you talk about unequal variances, a very simple rule falls out of this. And the very simple rule is that the ratio of the optimal proportions of the total sample and control and treatment is equal to the ratio of the standard deviations. So if the treatment has double the standard deviation, then of course we need to adjust the samples, the optimal proportions equivalently. Now, with equal variances, that's why everything was equal in treatment and control, and here we just adjust them based on the variances. That's a very simple rule of thumb. In many studies, you see that the treatment and control will always have the same number of observations. That might be that we just don't know, that we didn't know that the variances were, were unequal. A lot of times theory will give us some indication that the variances will be different. And what I'm arguing here is just take account of that because you'll increase your power if you shift the sample accordingly. Okay? So what about treatment levels? Now here what I'm thinking about is let's say we're interested in the number of ads, various price levels, various incentive levels, and let, let's stick with homogeneous treatment effects so that the outcome variance is equal. And let's think about, in this particular example, how we want to allocate our sample. So let's say that the firm tells you you can allocate the sample across incentive levels 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And let's say that the firm tells you that you can have 1,000 subjects. How do you want to allocate those subjects across the five cells? Okay, so are you thinking... say 20%, I'd say 40% here, 40% here, and the rest in the middle? Let's say that I assume it's linear. The relationship is linear, the outcome relationship is linear over the incentive space. Ninety-nine percent of people will say what? Equal. Ninety-nine percent of papers will say equal. None of you wanted to say it, right? Why didn't you want to say it? Because I wouldn't be asking the question. That'd be too obvious, all right? <laughs> but all of your intuitions are correct. And let's, let's back up and, and consider exactly what we're doing here. We're still, we can rest on the regression model and we can think about one of our goals here is to derive a very precise estimate of beta. So let's consider then what is the formula for the standard error of beta. What's important here is that I can gain precision with increasing the variance in my treatment variable in the same manner that I can increase precision by increasing n. Doubling n is the same thing as doubling the variance in x. That's what the, that's what the standard error formula tells us. So if I'm making a stand, I have a strong prior that this relationship is linear. What should I do with my 1,000? This is hardly ever done. Even if people make a strong stand on being linear, and even if they estimate a linear model, they will still have representation in the different cells. And most of the time, it will be a fifth, a fifth, a fifth, a fifth, a fifth. But certainly, you should put 
half on one end and half on the other end. Yes, Joe. Here do you want to have some people get nothing to get? I was just saying that you just get one to nine, and that's my, that's my group. But yeah, you have this baseline, which is everyone else in the world, but they haven't selected in, so I still have the selection problem on those, those folks. But you can still say, well, wait a second, I want some, I want to at least test whether it's nonlinear. If not for the economics of the problem, just to keep the referees off my back. What should you do then? Now it gets a little dicier. <laughs> Use your same intuition, but then add that you want to test linearity versus quadratic. Put everyone at five? Put some at five. What do you want? Let's just, I'm just saying quadratic, and we'll go to cubic and cortic. But this will give you the general idea. And, and we're thinking it's in the middle of the incentive zone. Okay. There's a rule, quarter, half, quarter. Okay. Intuitively, this gives us a test for the quadratic. You're comparing the mean with the mean outcomes at the extreme, and it gives us our variance as well. Yes, Justin. Yeah, the va I have variance. And then end, right? Ah, okay, okay. Do I have a, do I have a typo? Yeah, so, so then I, I understated my case, right, right. The case is even stronger. But I have this right, though. It's the standard error. Right. But I, thanks. Now, in cubic, how many cells do you think you should have per cubic? If linear two, quadratic three, cubic four, that's, that's just a general rule. And, and you, can, you can find this in any, any design booklet as well. But the general idea is you, you're, at the same time, you're testing the, the turns. You're also, te you're also taking into account variance. Okay, so this is just a, a quick rule of thumb on intensities that you can keep in the back of your mind. So let's end here, I'm going to have a little bit of time, about intracluster correlations. And here, what I want to mention is that This arises, I, I, would, I would guess, in, in a lot of develop, de developing work, and it's, it arises in a lot of work in firms and also in the lab when you have sessions. So the idea is, is when the level of randomization is different than the level that you're observing the outcomes at, you have to account for that difference via something called an intracluster correlation coefficient. And you should account for this, of course, before you go out and run the experiment. Now, let's go through an explicit example that hits home for me. We convinced United Airlines to run some incentive experiments. And in those incentive experiments, they insisted that randomization occur at the city level. Okay, they allowed us four cities to run the experiment in, with each city receiving, let's just say for sake, either high or low incentive. We're going we're gonna to disregard the zero case here. Thus, we're interested in the outcome, how many tickets are purchased by our various individuals in our experiment, and we're interested in how these high and low incentives affect those tickets purchased. 
and just for simplicity's sake, let's say each city we run the incentive experiment on an equal number of consumers, but the response of, of consumers might be correlated within the city. This is the intercluster correlation coefficient idea. Okay, so what I'm going to introduce here is the real sample size. So when you have intercluster correlation coefficients that matter or that are non-zero, you have to, in effect, penalize yourself by what I'm calling CE or the cluster effect. Okay, so MK, that's our typical number of observations that we think about in experiments. M is number of subjects in a cluster, K is number of clusters. This correction effect will be 1 plus rho multiplied by m minus 1, where rho is your intercluster correlation coefficient. Okay? And that's the variance between clusters divided by the sum of the variance between and within clusters. That's the definition of an intercluster correlation coefficient. So essentially, I need to think about how many clusters do I have? How many people do I have in each cluster? And what is the intercluster correlation coefficient equal to? And that will dictate how many observations I need in this particular setting. OK, so let's just think intuitively. What does rho going to 0 mean? Well, that means there's no correlation. So we don't need to adjust optimal sample sizes. We're back to our model that I presented earlier, essentially 15.68 times uh, standard, standard deviation divided by the minimal detectable effect squared. OK, we're back to that model when rho is 0. On the other hand, when rho goes to 1, now all responses in the cluster are identical. But there's a big tax now. Right? This is a very large adjustment because the real sample size is reduced to the number of clusters. Of course, in practice, now this is a hard coefficient to obtain in many settings. In practice, it would be somewhere between 0 and 1, but closer to 0 than, than 1, of course. So in our particular experiment, doing some pilot testing, we find that rho equals 0.04. So it must be the case that I'm not going to have to penalize myself by much, right? Because the rho is so small. What do you think? The part of the equation that I'm leaving out is Justin would say I'm understating now, which you'll see why. Let's say they wish to detect a one-tenth standard deviation change, and we want to use a standard approach. So I know right away that under the, under the old approach, a one-tenth standard deviation would suggest that I need 1,568 at each level. Okay, so in total, I have 3136 divided by 4, and that's what each city gets. That's under the old approach. Under the new approach, we have to think about what the real sample size is. Now, in this case, I can run it through that simple formula, and I see I have 784. Of course, that's um, this number divided by 4 times 4, and then the, the, the adjuster. I find that the real sample size in this case is 97. That's how big of a tax that a row of 0.04. How could a row of 0.04 have such a large tax? Because the number of clusters is only four, right? That, that hurts. Now, if you run, run this all the way through, we think about what is the required sample size, put it in the necessary sample size equation, and what we end up with is before, of course, we had that. Now we have 15.68 times 32, 32. We have 32 times the sample that we needed before, or 50, over 50,000 at each incentive level. Yes? Number of clusters is given. Exactly. That's, that's a different kind of problem, but if, if United tells me you can only have four cities, then I take it and I proceed like this. 
The other way is I can determine the optimal number of clusters and the number within that. And it's the same, it's the same sort of equation. Right, that's right. That's a richer problem um, and, and one that you can easily do with these equations. What's the trade-off between uh, the number of clusters and the number within each cluster on a, on a given row? Right? And, and the cost per observation, too. Yeah. All these, with all this, now you can do that. Yeah, that there, are, that, that there are peer effects. That you, these are things that you can estimate. If the randomization occurs at the, at the student level, then I can explore if I treated him but not his three friends versus if I treated him and his three friends, what are the differences in outcome variables? That, that seems to me like an empirical question after you set up the design, and your design might want to test for these peer effects, that there are, there are spillovers, so to speak. That's right. Right. But the treatment variable there is the number of kids in the classroom. And then they used, probably, did they use the classroom as the observation, or did they use the kids in the classroom as the observation? Probably varies depending on study. Exactly, that's causing that 0.04, and then we can explore what that is. Yeah, yes. I think it is, I think it is that way. What are the, the potential costs when you do it at the individual level? It's easier to do it at the city level, and you, there might be some contamination. This is what you were kind of talking about earlier was a contamination. I don't think of it as contamination. I think of that as kind of a rich empirical question. But, but yeah, that's, that's one of the trade-offs. Uh, if you had to make the decision in the end about cluster or individual, there might be good reason why you want, it, want to do it at the village level, a lot of good reasons, instead of at the individual level. And this, but this tax will be one of the variables that, that helps you determine that. Yes? You know, it's the same thing. And I just wrote that. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking about that this morning when I was watching Mark Burley of the White Sox pitch a perfect game. Um, and Here's exactly what I wrote down. The ratio of sample sizes is inversely proportional to the square root of the relative cost. So it, it has the same sort of flavor as the, the variance does. Okay, so let me read that again. Ratio of sample sizes is inversely proportional to the square root of the relative cost. Now, that was something that I was doing this morning. You can check me on that, but I, I believe that's correct. I'm confident that that's correct. Ratio of sample sizes is inversely proportional to the square root of the relative cost. But that's, that's a consideration that, that I haven't had in here yet. Um, and in some sense, you might be thinking, wow, there are a lot of things now that are going on because I have to consider cost. I have to consider what level to randomize. I have to consider row. Row's hard to, row's hard to detail, too. Michael, what are some rows in your world? A lot of times in education, I think about 0.05 or, or less or 0.1. Are you getting higher rows than that? You can get, so my experience is in education, you can get so many huge rows that you can get sort of unit of representation for school. And if it's two grades, it's just going to fall into the Yeah, if it's school. But I was thinking cla classroom. Oh, yeah, classroom yeah. within the school. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There's a lot of schools where there's just one class per grade. Uh,
Exactly. But then you get into this issue of one kid. That's what we have at Chicago Heights, which I'll talk about this afternoon, where we're randomizing at the individual level, and then one kid has it, and the kid next, next to her in class does not have it. Um, it presents some good things and some bad things. You can see the good things, um, but of course you can think about the bad things too. You want to add something to this? Okay, good. So let's end by talking a little bit about block design and factorial design and fractional factorial design. So what I have here is a depiction of a fractional factorial design wherein I'm thinking that there are three experimental variables. And if we want to talk about United or Walmart, we can think about price being one. We can think about number of ads being one. And we can think about rebates being a third variable. And as I, as I have on this, on this figure, you know, let's start over here and move this way, this way, or this way. I only have two levels of each particular variable. So each variable can either be low or high. And what one approach could be in this case is to run a full factorial experiment. What does that mean when I have three experimental variables that can either be low or high? How many, how many cells would I need? I need eight, right? Uh, two to the third. And all you need to do is count, count these. That's, that's if you, I'm, I'm not sure why anyone would do this, but sometimes people do this. <laughs> a lot of times people do a full factorial design, right? You want to get every interaction when two are, two are turned on, one's turned off, et cetera, et cetera. What would be a more efficient type of design that also maintains balance? And I've given you a hint up here. <laughs> turn them all on or turn one on at a time. That would be what would be considered a balanced, optimal, fractional factorial design. I'm not going to get into to why that's the case. We can talk about it afterwards since we're running out of time. But in that case, you have, why? Because you have each of, the, each of the individuals, and you also have all three turned on. You do miss something here, don't you? Right? You're making an assumption on some interactions, and you, are, you might be missing some important interactions. But nonetheless, you're running half, and you're doubling your sample size if, if you have a, a set budget or a set number of observations you can gather. Okay, so I'll leave this as a homework exercise, but let's compare this to block design. Okay, so on fractional factorial, literally think about as a student walks in, I have a set number of observations that I want in each of these cells, and then I just give them to people randomly as they walk in, and then when these cells are, are filled up, they're filled up. That would be a, a factorial design. A block design, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want men to have an equal, equal number of men in treatment, equal number in control, so I'm blocking on men, and that guarantees that I have representation of men in both the treatment and the control. Why is that nice? Well, that's nice because then I can look at heterogeneous treatment effects, for example, afterward, and I have some, some degree of power to detect whether my treatment is different across men and women. In a fractional design, that's not necessarily true. I might not have much representation in, in one of the important observables. So even if I do run a regression afterwards, I might not have a lot of power to detect heterogeneous treatment effects. So 
I'm increasing these cells here, and then I'm making assumptions on the interaction terms. You remember, I have the th I have the three though. Yeah. I have all of them turned on one by one, and then I have all three turned on. But then you you have two variances there. You get a noisier estimate. Um, you know, in, in the experimental literature, people many times do take gender as having experimental variation, and then they, they look at that, you know, think of it as, a, as sex rather than gender. Um, but there, it is true, though, that w in one case you have experimental variation, in the other you don't. So that's how, in, in fact, you should interpret the, the results from them as well. I think that, that's the main difference. But when you block on an observable characteristic, remember, all you want is, is some kind of representation that will satisfy a, a necessary power test. But in, the, and in that way, they're intertwined because I have, I, remember, I still have to back off and say, how many treatment cells should I actually have? Right? In the optimal design, given a fixed budget, it gives you an idea if you want to, type 1 error of 0.05 and type 2 error of 0.2, that also dictates your number of cells that you can have in, in an important way. But it, it, it dictates it in a lot different way than the, than the blocking when you have something endogenous coming in. Okay. Any other questions on this? They're just two different ways to randomize. One, I'm going to take a stand on blocking. So I'm going to make sure that half men and half women, half men get treatment, half, half men get control. This design does not ensure that. A factorial design does not, because it's, that's based, the randomization is based on timing or whatever, or coin flipping. I can block. I can block within a factorial design. Yeah. I can certainly block within that. Exactly. That's kind of where we're going. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay? So I have three minutes. I'm going to briefly introduce what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, hopefully to get you back. Um, I will start with one type of frame field experiment, which will be the Chicago Heights classroom performance experiments that we've run for the last year. And essentially what these are are... Uh, a few different incentive schemes to try to enhance the performance of students at Chicago Heights um, High School. Okay, B will be what I denote as an artifactual field experiment, and that will be hopefully complementary to what Michael talks about in that we go to a developing country but run an experiment in a different way than the way Michael usually thinks about running 
experiments in developing countries. Literally going into a village and having them play games. Lab games, essentially, is what this will be about. Okay, and C will be composed of natural field experiments, which a large part of it will be on the economics of charity. So these will be with nonprofit firms, and the idea will be trying to maximize the level of contributions to the charity or try to maximize the level of total contributions that people are making. And then we will also touch on experiments in various firms, United Airlines, Chrysler, Zappos Shoes, um, and a few other firms. I'll talk briefly about some experiments within those firms and what we've learned so far in running natural field experiments for them. And hopefully they've gotten something from us. In many cases, they've made a little bit of money. So that's where this afternoon will be going. I will be talking primarily about examples in the field experimental literature. So I wanted to use this morning for, let's think about what a field experiment is. Let's think about why they're useful. And let's think about if I wanted to run a field experiment tomorrow, what are some of the design considerations? We've only scraped the design considerations. I mean, I, I'm thinking very hard recently about Bayesian sampling. I, I think that, I see that as the future of experimentation within economics because it's, it's just so much more efficient. But I just don't know enough about it yet to, to, talk, to talk with you in a, in a reasonable manner. But I, I, think, I think that's where this area is going. And I think it's going there for, um, in, in some sense, a good reason. There will also be, I mean, classical will remain. But I see the future is, is moving into that area for optimal design. OK? And I said, well, there is no error in the equation. And it's true, there is no error in the equation. But the sentence above it, there's an error. <laughs> so you, you like to be internally consistent in your slides. This is a variance, right? This isn't a standard error. That's why I kept looking at that saying, no, I'm saying variance divided by n times variance of x. That's OK. But what Justin was saying is you're, you're better off. But because he was thinking that I had the right standard error. That's not the standard error. That's a variance. So um, that's why when I was looking at it, I was like, what is he talking about? Uh, I, I didn't really understand. But I, I didn't put it together with the sentence. The sentence above is wrong. The, uh, the equation's right. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. OK, I wanted to come back to that. That um, The, the trade-off is still n and variance of x. but. You certainly, if you do the trade-off with n and standard deviation, then you have exactly what Justin was saying. OK, good. So let's go on to something more fun. And that's actually talking about the applications of field experiments. And there's a little variety here. And what I mean by variety is I've tried to pick out three particular types of field experiments to maintain consistency with the idea of having an artifactual field experiment example, a framed field experimental example, and a natural field experimental example. But to be honest, they are at very different stages in, um, in how confident I can talk about the results. OK, the first framed field experiment I'll talk about is classroom performance. We're still literally getting data from this, as you'll find. So it's very preliminary, but we can talk about what the data are saying so far. The artifactual field experiment has been around for a little while. I'm now revising it to go into a journal. So this idea has been around, but exactly what we learn from it is still up for debate. So I wanted to throw that out to you. And we can argue about exactly if we've learned anything from that artifactual field experiment. And, and it's nice in the sense that I'm not obtaining identification off of randomization in my artifactual field experiment. OK? And then the natural field experiment, I'll start with a discussion about the economics of charity and give you four or five different papers and, a, and just a line of research that I've been thinking about since 1998. And then after that, we will talk about experiments within firms, for-profit for firms, 
as I promised, okay? So let's start with this framed field experiment using incentives to improve educational achievement. This experiment actually started last September, September of 2008, and people in Chicago Heights, Chicago Heights is a community, it's a suburb just south of Chicago. So it's very close to where I actually live. I live in Flossmoor, Illinois. Chicago Heights borders Flossmoor. And in fact, the police officers speculated that the people who robbed my home on July 4th were, were probably from Chicago Heights. So as, as we'll find, this is, um, this is a community that needs help. Giving back to the community, literally giving back. <laughs> and at the end, we'll see that um, I just secured $11 million to give even more back to Chicago Heights. So why not keep giving, right? Laptop here, laptop there, what the heck. Okay, now in this particular experiment, what we're going to be doing is comparing long-term incentives to short-run incentives. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And we're going to cross those with who actually receives the pecuniary reward. It will either be given to the child or the parent. Okay, and we have certain theoretical predictions of you know, just from a simple household bargaining model, which I won't go through today, but we're testing some of those implications. And we also think that we can speak to policymakers through this particular frame field experiment as well. Okay, in the end, what we're looking at is some cost-effective ways to improve student performance. Okay, so a little bit about Chicago Heights. There's a lot of in-migration from the Chicago housing projects. Okay, middle-class families are tending to leave Chicago Heights. Percentage of low-income students in the public high schools has increased from about 39.5 to 68.7 in the decade from 99 to 2008. Okay. They have very low achievement. So the two high schools that we're working with, they roughly have 1,000 kids enter ninth grade every year. And about 470 of those kids end up receiving high school diplomas. The rest drop out. And they typically drop out right around the ninth, between ninth and 10th grades. Okay, so it's a, it's a serious problem that they wanted us to attack at the ninth grade level. Okay, this whole ideal is under this Chicago Heights promise. I was approached about two years ago with, you know, basically asking me, do you have ideas to help Chicago Heights? And it was based on trying to improve high school graduation, which we're talking about here, trying to bring families back, and trying to stimulate economic and community development. I won't talk about two and three. Those are other types of experiments that we're running. I'll just talk about bullet point one right now. Okay, so what are our treatments in this particular case? The treatments, again, are, are whether the, the student receives their financial reward or whether the parent receives a reward. And we we're going to cross that with whether it's a piece rate or a lottery. Okay, now the piece rate, provided that you satisfy four outcome variables, which I'll define in a minute, at the end of every month, we will give you $50 in cash. That's a piece rate. The lottery is, provided you qualify, you have a chance. We will pull out 10 names, and it's roughly 1 in 10, one in 10 chance, to receive $500 in cash. Okay? Your name can be pulled out, and we will announce your name, and then you will get the money or not, depending on whether you've qualified. So we know those people who, whose names were pulled out at the end of September and who received the money and who also did not receive the money. Okay? All the names are put into a fishbowl. All the names in that particular treatment, and I'll give you the, the numbers in the treatment cells in a minute. And we will pull out 1 in 10, 10% of the names. And if you qualify, you get a check for $500. If you don't qualify, you get nothing, but you know that your name was called. And, and if it's in the parent treatment, your parent knows that your name was called, and now she does not receive the $500. Now, I'm very careful in saying she, because a lot of these kids have a one-parent family, and it's the mom. Not all, a lot. Okay? So what are our outcomes? On the grade dimension, you cannot have any D's or E's. 
That's not a misprint. In, in this school district, an E is an F. Okay? In any class at the end of the month. That's outcome one. Behavior. No all-day suspensions in school or out of school. Attendance. No more than one unexcused absence. Okay? Standardized test performance, meet grade level reading score, or improve on your fall test score. We don't have a lot of these observations, as you can see, because we're only observing this in February and May. Yes? This was all based on how many people we thought would qualify. We had $400,000 for this study. How many people we thought would qualify, which how many people would you guess would qualify per month? You're going to be shocked. <laughs> no, it's rough, roughly 30% to start after a month. 30. Um, we overestimated that, and, and then we, we put that with these, and then we wanted these to be equal. And then that's how we, we simply did that. I, I have no general theory about whether 75 is a lot better than 50. But, of course, I'm going to have a baseline, so I'm going to have 0, 50, and then this lottery. Okay? Now, remember, we only have two schools. So we can't randomize across schools. What do you think we should do? We're going to randomize at the individual level. And then we know which school they're from. Now, that presents some issues that we talked about earlier. But that's the world that we're in here. Okay, so randomizing at the individual level, here are the numbers for student rewards. So remember that student receiving the cash, piece rate, we start with a 187. In the end, there ended up being 193 because some kids moved in. Some kids move out, some kids move in. 193 in the lottery, in the student lottery, 199 total. Parents, remember this is if your child qualifies, then at the end of the month, you are given $50. In this case, here, if your child's name is drawn, you receive $500. And then we have a baseline of 188 Yes? So, so the teachers don't know, but I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if they found out. Yeah, and we have data before the program, and it looks to us so far that the control is a lot like the data were before, but it could just be that our kids were worse this year, and then they upped them to look like before. I'm not sure, but that's, that's our check from the pre-experiment. Okay? Okay, so let's start by looking at the data. September, this is a month. Go ahead, go ahead. I haven't heard anything like that, but I did hear one anecdotal story that a parent was calling a teacher that they presumed would otherwise not call. I don't doubt that there are other stories like that, too. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. Um, so then you're going to be even shocked more because our results will be really tiny. Justin. No, this is full factorial design. Why? Because I don't have levels of the, of the payment. I, I just took the stand that it's going to be 50. Yeah, I, think that I thought there could be important interaction effects between parent and lottery. And that's what our theory says, too. It has predictions on it, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. When you do this, you have spillovers. But I looked at it as we have, we have a survey at the beginning where we get an idea of their friend base, whether they're in a gang, et cetera, et cetera. And a treatment like this then will help us to answer those types of questions. But it will lead, it could potentially lead to, when you say spillovers, you must mean your counterfactual is randomizing at the school level and changing the ethos of the school. 
So I'm not going to claim that this particular intervention would be a good model for that. It might be, it might not be. But what this will be able to answer are certain theoretical questions about when you put some people in treatment and some of their friends not, what can you expect for a specific treatment effect and, and testing some household theory and social interconnectedness theory there. But I'm perfectly willing to, to say that I'm not going to now take these results and then go to the government and say we should be randomizing at the school level based on these results because I'm just not, that's, that's a compromise. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's look at the a little bit of the data. This is proportion of students meeting. These are just grade standards. So after a month, you can already see only about 35 to 45 percent of these students are qualifying on grades. This is after just a month. Okay, and what I have here, this is a control. And as you can see, right around here, we're thinking we're in pretty good business. And we're not sure exactly what happened at the end here. But for some reason, at the end, the control between April and May went from 26% to about 27.5% or 28%. Betsy? That was the point of the answer before. I'm not sure, but when you look at previous data from previous years, freshmen who are not treated, it looks a lot like these trajectories that I'll show you. But again, that's, that's not solid evidence that there's not something else going on here. No doubt. I mean, it, the, the literature will say both ways, right? John Henry effect, I'm going to work even harder. Or the forget this effect, I'm just going to quit. So it, It looks about like the control in the previous year's data. Exactly. I mean, you get more chances to f you have more chances to fail in a, in a given month. So that should make sense. Now, what happens here then on the, the student lottery, as you can see, it, that dipped up as well. Parent piece rate, parent lottery, and as you can see here, this is student piece. So there's, there's I'd say there, that there's some evidence of a treatment effect here. Not strong, but some evidence. Let's, say, let's look at meeting all the standards now. And as you can see, same thing. Most of, the, most of the time when you don't meet all the standards, it's because of grades. That's the typical mark. Now, you see the same thing. This, during this time period, you can guess that we're thinking this program is having a big, a big effect. And then again, we're not clear what, what happened here, but the control just has a huge jump at the end. Okay, so I'm not, you got to decide whether you want to talk about, you want to integrate these or you want to look at the final, final points. Well, of course, we can do both. Now, that's the end of the school years, right? Yeah, so, so we're still not sure, so I can't comment on, on exactly what happened at the school. So I will have measures for you of, of how many people in treatment and control went on to 10th grade or are, are scheduled to go to 10th grade. We're not sure if they're going to show up. Exactly. We need to find out the story about, about this. And I don't have the story right now, but I'm, I think there will be. Either it's uh, an error or there's something else going on that I was not aware of in the school. Okay. The problem is it's hard to get administrators' attention after this. Um, I'm not quite certain why. Okay, so here, what I, all I've done here is meet all standards, and I've put the, the treatment group, I've pulled that, and I've, I've, pulled, I've just placed the control group on that, and, and you can see why we have some enthusiasm about, about this particular result, that there should, looks like there could be something going on. Okay? So what I've done here is I've summarized, looking at the absence standard, this is a control, dark is always control, light is the treatment pooled now, suspension, grades, all standards, and currently passing to the ninth grade. Currently passing the ninth grade, going to the tenth grade. Okay, so if we summarize these things, what we find is that we're spending about $160 per student on 700 students to get about a 5 to 7% boost in ninth grade passing rates. 
So this equates to about 35 to 50 extra passing students because of our treatment. Okay, or between 2,300 to 3,300 per pass student. To put that into perspective about Chicago Heights, they're spending $7,700 per student, 13,000 operational. Okay, or 13,000 per pass student. That's not exactly a fair comparison because we're on, we're on a nice margin and they might not be. But nonetheless, this, this puts into perspective, I think, exactly what our program's trying to do and, and gives you one metric of, of its success. We have other metrics like did you get thrown in jail? Um, did you quit a gang, et cetera, et cetera? We don't have any of those um, coded and ready to talk about. But I think overall, this, I, would, I would rate this as a modest success. Yes? Yeah. That, that's exactly right. A, a, what I call a peer cheerleading effect. And that's exactly right. We're, we're doing that the second year now. Um, we did not do that here. What I would say here is this is a cheerleading slash incentive effect. And we just didn't have the sample size to parse out the cheerleading effect. Now we will in the second round. But, but you're exactly right. I think that's an interesting qu That has not worked in the past in other areas, but I think it's it's worth looking at now that we see this. Because that could be a very cost-effective way of doing things. Yeah, I'm worried less about that. Because as I'll show you, we'll also have standardized tests. And we'll have a result on standardized tests, too. I'd be more worried about that this is just a cheerleading effect. Somebody cares about what you're doing, and you've responded that way. And the money just is a nice add. I don't think that's true. I think cheerleading will do poorly, and the money is a big reason for this particular community, but I, I, can't, I can't speak um, too swiftly about that right now. Yes? No, so now we will follow these people through and look exactly at how this, this notion affects going through, and we will start to treat other, other students as well. I agree. Look, it might be the case that we've just prolonged the inevitable. And we've kept a bad person in the classroom causing trouble who should have never been in the classroom, but we've gotten them to 10th grade, but then after the money's gone, they're gone by Thanksgiving. That could be true. Um, we'll find out. Yeah, and that's one reason why we want to let them go now. Yes? So the one that's significant is, is this point is significant at about the 7% level. These were all significant at better than the 5% level. OK? Yes? They're paid at the end of each month. We have a meeting. And in the lottery, the names are picked. And they run up and jump around and, and get their cash. And you can trust that the company that has the extra failure? Yeah, and, and also the composition of failure. So is it true, maybe in the treatment you're only failing one, where in the others you're, you're failing two, three, or four? Um, none of that data work has been done. Or if your name's called and you didn't qualify, then are you a star student afterwards? Which is, I kind of did the teaser at the beginning. I don't know that result. Exactly, exactly. It just prolongs it, and then maybe there's some value in keeping them afloat, right? Even though they failed in the end, there's still value there. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so, so you can do it in your head right now, right? I told you a half standard deviation is 64. Right, so you, and then I gave you a tenth is 1568. All right, so you can see that we st we still need pretty large effects. Okay, N I mean not not lab large, but but large enough. Yeah. Okay, so h how did we tie in one-time incentives? We also went into these schools. So we have access now, K through, all the K through 8s and the two high schools, we have access to run experiments um, in. We ran 
some incentivized experiments just on standardized tests for the 8th and the 10th graders. We, don't, we didn't want to go in and mess around with the 9th graders because they're incented in the long run, in our long run program. But what we did with these groups is we simply walked in the morning of the test. And if you were in the $1 group, you were told if you improve on your score from last fall or if you're over the standard, you will receive a dollar. We have the same statement for 10 and the same statement for 20, and we also have a control, which is don't even enter at all. Go ahead. No, if we had to get active consent, I think it would have been very hard to do this. So we give a consent form that says, if you want to opt out, sign this form and send it back in, and then your son and da or daughter will be opted out of the experiment. So we use an opt-out consent form, and I, th I think this sort of thing should fall under a, a different type of, of review than giving somebody drugs, something like that. I just, these types of experiments seem to me to be relatively innocuous. Well, I agree, but, okay. I, I, but nonetheless... We had a reverse consent form that we ran through the IRB, and that's what they did. Okay? What do you think happens here when I go from 0 to 1 and 1 to 10, 10 to 20? Just announcing it in the morning. So they could have partied all night, not knowing that the incentive was coming in the morning. What do you think happens? Can I get the same oomph just from this as what I'm paying all that other money for if I'm just interested in standardized tests? Do you think so? Let's see. Okay. Let's start over here. This is a baseline. And this is improvements in standard deviations, test scores between fall and spring. Baseline, you can see they improved roughly 0.28 standard deviations over that time period. If we give them a dollar for the 10th grade reading incentive, um, it only happened with 10th graders, though. It did not happen with 8th graders, as you can see. But give them a buck. And the school administrators were really happy we did that, right? Why were they happy? Because they get in trouble when they have, I'm speaking facetiously, of course, they get in trouble when their uh, kids do poorly on the standardized exams. So they weren't too happy with us giving a dollar. And as you can see, the average went down 0.4 standard deviations. $10 in that case was flat. 20 looked pretty good. Now in the eighth grade, you can see here does not look so good for math. For some reason, the 10 is higher. Here, everything goes up. And what I put in over here is the treatment and control for the ninth grade. That's, that's our, our long-term project. So now you can put these dollar values, 10th grade reading scores from 0 to 20, it's $59 per standard deviation improvement. If you're just about standardized test scores, then it's, this tells you something clear, because that $59 is a lot cheaper than $253, which is the regular Chicago Heights Miracle Program. All right. And here, of course, we don't have any effect. This one is about $100 per standard deviation improvement. It's just walking in the morning of the test and paying a meaningful incentive. If you're into standardized test scores, these data would at least suggest between what we did in the miracle program and what you can do walking in, it's walk in in the morning, of course. You get much more bang for your buck. I'm not advocating this, of course. I'm just saying I'm making a positive statement here, not a normative one in our data. This is all about effort, I think. It's all about effort. Millions of dollars are given to schools based on these tests. That's why I was arguing that I'm sure the administrators didn't really like that because the money that they receive in their school district depends on how well their kids do on standardized test scores. That's why they care. This shows you exactly why you might not want to use such a thing in less effort. Yeah. Increases effort. Any questions about this? Yes. Yeah, it, it is huge, and 
My initial thought is that this could happen in all of the treatments. There's a, there's a little, not yet a stylized result in the experimental community that if you incent people at a really small rate, you crowd out intrinsic motivation with the extrinsic motivation, and then it dilutes effort. So this would be under, now it could be several models. These guys are, are telling me that the standardized test really isn't that important. Where before I thought it was important, so I'm going to try harder. But now they're telling me only a dollar. I'm not going to try. I mean, that's one type of model. Um, there are other models in public goods where if you think about every morning, if you take a, a bag of cans out to the, the curb and you're receiving no financial incentive, you're your neighbors might call you an environmental steward, but the minute that they put a nickel a can of monetary incentives and you take the bag out, I'm sure your neighbors are not calling you an environmental steward anymore. They're calling you a greedy something. Right? So that, that's consistent with that, but it only happens here with 10th graders, not 8th graders. So I'd These are reasonably large samples, so this isn't a small sample issue. Wayne? Yeah. Exactly. I, I agree. I, that's why I didn't try to spin a story. When I was asked a question, I tried to give a reason why that could be the case. Clearly, this isn't a general result in our data set. Yeah. Okay. Good. Where are we going now? I talked about the $11 million. That's going to be going to some early education interventions. Um, our thoughts right now are in the realm that if you really want to make a difference, most of these ninth graders are reading at a fourth grade level or a fifth grade level. It's very hard for them, of course, to catch up. So maybe we should be focusing our attention on pre-K programs. That's exactly where the early education and intervention uh, program is going. And the teacher incentive program is something that we're thinking instead of incentivizing the students, maybe we should be incentivizing the teachers. And it's hard, right, because you get into these this outcome space that you might not want to be in. And standardized tests are one thing, and, and you can think about that particular outcome, but the rest of them, um, you might have some trouble implementing it in a clean way and, and get clean data. But that's where this particular set of framed field experiments, uh, the line of research is going. Okay. Okay, well, let's go down a different path. And let's think about an artifactual field experiment that might complement some of the work that Michael will be talking about this afternoon. And that is in this area of gender and competition, which I'm not a, a creator of. The, the original creators include Yuri Ganesi and Aldo Rustichini and Muriel. Niederle, Lisa Vesterlund, are doing very interesting work that is at least suggesting that women shy away from competition. Okay? So one stylized result from this literature has been that it, it appears that women tend to select into competitive environments with a smaller probability than counterpart men. I'm not going to take a stand on whether that's risk aversion, true competitive preferences, et cetera. Let's, let's leave it here for now. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's add some flavor. And this is, some, this is the, one of the studies from the group. So I have on the y-axis the fraction of people who choose to compete. Okay, so what does that mean? 
They bring in a group of students and they tell them, today you will be solving anagrams for five minutes. And to pay you for the anagram, number of anagrams that you correctly solve, you can either choose a piece rate scheme, which will pay you, say, 50 cents per anagram solved, or you can choose a tournament scheme, which if you solve more than the anonymous person next door, you will receive $1.50 per anagram solved. If you solve fewer, you will receive zero. And what they find in these particular studies is, regardless of whether it's, a, say, a female-dominated task, and what I mean by female-dominated task is that females tend to do better than males at solving anagrams. In this case, 40% of men choose to compete, 25% of women choose to compete. Shooting basket, this should say basketball, roughly 52% of men choose to compete and roughly 15% of women choose to compete. This is the, the result that these authors have been pushing in the literature. No. Okay. So when I read the literature, I started to think about what could be causing these differences in behavior. Right away, you can go to risk aversion. You can go to several other, other potential explanations, which, which Lisa Vesterlund and Muriel, in part, took off the table with their recent QJE paper. But for me, I, I was thinking along the lines of, what, of sex versus gender. Because remember, the experiments here, you're, look, you're looking at something that has arisen endogenously, gender, and then you're placing the controls around that variable that has arisen endogenously, and you're trying to interpret what the data are telling you. You're not, get, you're not achieving identification off randomization, unless you would say this is all sex. Right? Now, by sex, I mean what you're born with. By gender, I mean what you're born with plus what society tells you you are, and what society tells you is appropriate behavior. Okay. So I was thinking about a straw man hypothesis. And just entertain me for a few moments. A straw man hypothesis of the form, on average, in every society, men are more competitively inclined than women. Now, if I want to test that straw man hypothesis, one first step would be to think about going to two distinct societies and trying to choose societies that are all the way from, let's say, matrilineal to patriarchal. There are no matriarchal societies that I know of. Okay, so that's exactly what this artifactual field experiment will try to do. Okay, so where is my patriarchal society? Michael, can you tell me what tribe I'm dealing with here? I'm just south of your, your stomping ground. This is Maasai, the Maasai tribe. Okay, the, the red-robed Maasai tribe. Are women treated very well? Anybody know about the Maasai in this area? Are women treated well? They're not. In fact, they're treated like property. In fact, if you own 11 head of cattle, that gives you the right to have one more wife. And the long and short of it is, is that this is a very male-dominated society. So think about this as a cross-country regression. I couldn't get, shouldn't get too excited. That's the way I think you should think about this particular line of research so far. Okay? So now I want to go all the way to the other side, to a, a matriarchal society, and I'm going to go here, and this isn't the, the safest part of India. Uh, anyone recognize what, what society would be up here that's matrilineal? Okay, this is the Cassie Society. All of the wealth in the Cassie society runs through the youngest female in the family. If you send one child to school, it will be the female in the family. Men have argued for years that they deserve equal rights and equal wealth uh, ownership. It's not quite as far as a patriarchal society, but some men have... have 
felt that they need to develop groups that ensure that they have the proper rights within the society. I agree with Michael that it's too hard for me to keep track of all of these societies, so I just choose two, and then I just stick with them. So we've been back now to India five or six times to try to figure out exactly what's going on in these data. It's, it's just easier for me to, to try to think about what's going on in the society rather than be all around the world. Now, I'm not, I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm told that these two quotes do a reasonable job in dictating exactly what's going on in these two societies. My favorite is from the Cassie man. We are sick of playing the roles of breeding bulls and babysitters. Um, of course, the Maasai women think they're treated like donkeys. But now, what in the world do you do? Do you go here and, and solve anagrams? <laughs> no, why? Because the Maasai women and the men will refuse to pick up a pencil. So that's hard. But what task can you think about using? They have a very hard time thinking abstractly as well. So whenever you see experiments run in these types of societies, when it involves abstract thinking, be very careful. We ran several experiments, and you can see there's just a lot of noise when you tax these types to think in an abstract way. Okay. So what did we do? You're going to think I'm crazy, but it's the best idea we had. We had men and women throw 10 tennis balls in a bucket. And they ran through the exact same experiment. It's three meters away. They're told you have 10 shots, 10 attempts. If you choose the piece rate, you are, get, you are given roughly 50 cents, which at that time I believe was a few weeks worth of wages. These are pretty high, high stakes. If you chose to compete, every one you made, if you made more than the anonymous partner, you received $1.50. And we simply did the exact same type of experiment with folks in uh, the Maasai tribe and with folks in the Cassie tribe. Okay. Okay, so what I can tell you, though, is that the distributions are not different across men and women in either of these two societies. What they're good at is this. What they're not so good at is this. Even though when we went back the second time, the Cassie were really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time, they <laughs> So we wanted a, a first inclination of, of like competitive tendencies. Yeah, what I'm saying is that when you look at the distribution of... When you look at the distribution of makes in this particular game, they're similar. I'm not going to take a stand on what are the underlying motivations if I see... Let's talk about the results when you see them. So it's something about society that's giving women more ability, the way you're defining it, than in the Maasai tribe. That's the whole idea, isn't it? I'm trying to get at this idea. If it's straight biology and, it's, and society cannot overcome the biological differences... I'm not going to foreshadow my results, but I'm testing my straw man hypothesis, and it will be a cross-country regression. I feel like I'm on firm ground there. Okay, go ahead. Yes. They're in a di no, they're in a di these are done in classrooms, and they're in a different classroom. Throwing at the same time, they never learn who that anonymous competitor was, and they're all paid in private. But we don't know what they do with their cash when they leave. It might be the case that the Maasai women, they're, they're forced to give the money to the husband. We don't know. When they did, we said we can't tell you. The second round of experiments, we told them explicitly the gender of their, which I don't have here. Um, but when they, were, when they asked, we did not tell them. Yes. Ex ex exactly. And this might be a case of just trust, that the initial results are all based on men tend to trust the experimenter more than women in the U.S., and it's all about that. Ex exactly. What we did here to account for that is we had them play these trust games, and then we try to control for that. So if you believe you're, you're getting something like that, it, it, it at least the result stands even after you 
control for, quote, trust the way that we measured it in the standard trust game. But short of that, you're exactly right. It's the same as risk aversion, isn't it? Uh, with a lottery, you have a higher variance. Right? So then we, we did these little risk games, and then we try to control for that, too. Right? So we try to take on a few of the major obstacles, but certainly we, we have not taken them all on in this first experiment. Um, so I, I take Michael's point earlier that this is a good way to, to look at behavior in high stakes games, and you can vary stakes easily. This particular result, we did not vary stakes here, but in the second and third rounds we did, and the results more or less hold up. But um, I think that that's a, a big use, an important use in the end of, of these types of environments for artifactual field experiments that you will be able to liberally vary the stakes and then look at stakes effects in that society. And then you hope, of course, it doesn't interact with something in the society that would frustrate any generalizability. But you don't know without a theory and more empirical work. Okay, so what do you think happens? Go ahead. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you the gimme. Yes. In this round, no. In the second and third rounds, we did, and then we had feedback. So we said, "You're playing against a male. How many do you think you will make? How many do you think he will make? Do it." Then we tell them, and then we have them make the choice again to see if men and women respond differently to feedback. Yeah. You can see right away when you set this up that there are then a million other experiments that it leads to, and that's exactly right. That's, in a way, it's seductive. Yeah. Okay? So Tanzania, well, that looks like America. I don't know if that's good or bad, Luigi, but nonetheless, it looks like America. When you run these in the U.S., this is about what you get. Men compete at a rate of 50%, women at a rate of 25%. Okay? Now, for those of you who have not seen this, let me ask you, what do you think is going to happen when I click? Elizabeth, you probably haven't seen it. Are you paying attention? Okay, what do you think is going to happen? I like to do this because if I put it up there, everyone says, oh, that was obvious. But when I don't, I usually get a room of about 50-50 split, and then we can argue about what it means. Okay. Why would that worry you, though? Because <laughs> Wayne right in front of you is saying, I hope it looks the same. <laughs> no, not that he would. But. Luigi? Even worse. Oh, reverse. I thought you said even worse. Okay, good. We have one on each side. And that's exactly what does happen. Those two... Uh, these two are significant, different from each other. These two are as well. These two are. This is close. Okay. Now, we can let our imaginations run wild, but let me just put a few controversial things up there for speculative interpretations. Cassie society may remove social barriers that prevent naturally competitive women from expressing their true personalities. That's consistent with this. It's also consistent that it may allow competitive women to earn greater rewards for their effort and pass on wealth to their daughters. Right? And I'm sure you can spin, on a lot of, spin out a lot of stories as well. But it does, I think, begin this discussion. At least we're, we're trying to think about, in this sense, how powerful is socialization? How powerful can socialization be and it at least opens up the opportunity to look at other quirky things, maybe in the U.S. or other areas where people are randomized. Again, these people are not randomized into the societies either. So I'm um, putting control around the society. And to refine this type of finding, what we're doing is we're going the biological route now, and we're going over and taking testosterone and blood to find out if the, bi if the biological markers are fundamentally different. And... The, the blood ran into problems because a, chief, a few of the chiefs thought that we were going to take the blood and feed it to the snakes, and the snakes would then come back and kill them. So that got shot down after a few villages, which our, our person on the ground there promised us that these chiefs agreed to give blood, so we ended up getting a bunch of saliva, which is fine for testosterone. Okay? Now, I think it's fair to say that we should be thinking hard about replicating these results, and we should think hard about 
other types of experiments that can help to refine the interpretation of these data. I'm willing to go that far. Any questions on this? Is that okay now? You were skeptical. Is that, not, is that an all right interpretation? Okay, good. <laughs> that means no, I'm in trouble. Um, any other issues with this? Yes, go ahead, Betsy. I agree. I agree. I could look at CEOs, and, and I think women would be very competitive CEOs. And I'm with you. And I wish I had one more set of bars here because right next to these Cassie societies are some patriarchal Cassie societies. They look like this. So right next door, you have this, uh, this large difference as well. I think that's where you're going with the, that's right. That's our new control group now, the patriarchal societies. And we, we haven't gone back to the Maasai tribe. We've just focused on the Patri and um, Maitri societies in India, they're right next to each other, and they have very little crossover. Very, very few people will go from one tribe to the other. So then it's, you were born into it. Right. Okay, good. That's a good question. Thank you. Natural field experiments. And I think I have, what, 35 minutes? 3.15. My identification now will all arise from randomization, and I will be in the world where people do not even know that they're taking part in an experiment. Okay, so if, if you want to now along the way bring up informed consent or how I'm able to do this, we can, we can think about these questions. I'm going to start by being in the not-for-profit world, give you a few giving facts, and then tell you a little bit about some of the research, and then I'm going to go to the for-profit world. Let's go to the charitable market. This is the way I think about this particular market. I, I see three major players. The government, of course, sets rules on the charities, and they set marginal tax rates and rules on how donors can write off perhaps the $10 million that they give to a charity. There, in, within the NBER itself, there, there's been a lot of research, Marty Feldstein, Claude Felter, et cetera, looking at that relationship. When you change marginal tax rates, how do people's behaviors change in terms of giving? Very little evidence here. And what I mean by this is when the government sends a $20 million grant to the YMCA, how do they react? Do they then go out and raise less money? Do they use that as a gift to raise more money and then provide more of the public good? So that's an interesting question that still is not sorted out. My own research, I'm going to focus down here, the relationship between charities and specific donors. Okay, so why is this important? I'm looking at individuals. It's roughly, in any given year now, charitable giving is roughly 2 to 3% of GDP. So I think it's, it's a big chunk of GDP that we know very little about why people give it. I think that's fair to say empirically. We have a lot of anecdotes. Individuals take up about three quarters of that. Corporations, foundations, bequests, the rest. I'm not going to look at these at all. I'll be focusing on individuals. Okay, over time, how has individual giving changed? It's sort of interesting. As you can see, the as a percent of personal income, it's kind of jogged down. And then the late 90s, you have a sudden jump, and you can speculate why. And so can I, of course. Yes. What's that? Uh, a gift to a 501c that you can write off on your taxes in the um, giving to um, a charitable foundation. Not time. Monetary gift, pecuniary. Okay? So, so I, I sufficiently understate the importance of charity by not including volunteerism. 
Yeah, and as we'll see, that's going to be a big chunk of this. I'll have that in a minute. You're exactly, that's, the, that's good intuition. Okay, so what I have here, and this is from 95, so I, I apologize. I don't have um, something later than that. This gives you a sense of how people give over income ranges, over age, and over education levels. Okay, in total, percent of households that give back in 95 was about two out of three. Now it's close to 90%. So more people give money uh, now than they did back in 95. They gave about 2% of household income here, $1,000 on average. As, as you can see here, as a percent, it goes down and then back up. As a total, of, it just makes sense. So if you're, most of you are in here, you should be giving, if on average, 95, about $3,500 a year. I'm sure all of you are giving much more than that. Um, and the reason why is because you're a college graduate or more, so you're down here as well. Um, this is a little bit funky. I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. We can have different stories, which I don't have time to go into right now. Uh, but this gives you a glimpse of how giving varies over the life cycle. Okay? Now, where does this money go? A big chunk of it's to religious organizations. 59.4% of total household contributions goes to religious organizations. That's because it's overweight, it's overweight in the poor. Um, and, you know, education, you have a little bit here, 9%. And then you can see the others. Okay. I am just now starting experiments with this group. And it's only because I've given talks at these uh, Lutheran organizations. The Lutherans are trying to raise money, and as part of the agreement, I, I get access to their entire database to run experiments. But as far as I know, I don't know of any experiments with these religious groups. Okay, so I, I can't speak to that in my own data right now. Yes? Yeah, now when you say in, anything back, you, you, can't, you won't be in here if you get some good in return, some tangible good in return. Yeah, so if I'm in the YMCA and I have to pay for my kid to be in basketball, I do not think that would be in here. But if I give $1,000 and I can write it off, then they will be in there. I will not dig deeper into this, but that, that's right. So why should we study this? I think, I think theoretically thinking about why people give to charities and, and what models best predict their behavior is a, is a useful avenue for research. You know, measuring the key parameters of these models is also useful. It, various elasticities can be important from a policy perspective. Collecting the information to construct a theory. So that's where this particular research agenda is going. Now, on a practical side, I think this quote picks up exactly what's going on in this industry. There is an extraordinary amount of money available. The lack is of good ideas on how to get the basket under the apple tree. And that's exactly right. So besides theory and policy, the, the demand side of the economics of charity is, is ill understood. And I've, I've learned that in the last 10 or so years about how little the fundraisers actually know um, in terms of make, being able to make causal statements. Okay, so let's, let's start at the beginning and why in the world am I involved in this particular activity? So if you're an administrator, the administrator, the dean at the University of Central Florida did something that probably most administrators would never do. I was an assistant professor in 1998 in the economics department in the business school and the dean visited every department and said, I realize that we cannot be good at all kinds of research activities. Even though you have 26 people in the econ department, I know you can't compete in I.O., labor, environment, et cetera, et cetera. So I want you to choose one area. And when you've all decided the area, come back and tell me, and then I will put all the resources into that area. <laughs> 
That's exactly what happened. So we argued and argued and argued. And the area that the department chose was a specialty in environmental economics with a subspecialty in experimental economics. And that won something like 25 to 1 in our department. So, of course, I was the advocate of environment and experiment. And the dean then visited my office and said, now that you have won this battle, I want to give you $5,000 to start a Center for Environmental Policy Analysis. <laughs> Congratulations on being the winner. I talk about a winner's curse. I thought about it for a long period of time and thought, I will do this provided I can use that $5,000 in a field experiment. And I think now you see the way that I roll. I see the world, I see it as an experiment, and I look at how I can use the variation that I observe and the variation that I can put into the world to learn something about economics. Everything that I am presented with in the back of my mind, I think, can I turn that into a field experiment? That's how I've always been since I was an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. Okay, so that's why these field experiments at sports card shows and pin markets, uh, Cassie Tribe, et cetera, et cetera, that's where these, these arise. He talked to the, uh, the officials and they said, yes, you can let List go ahead and run this as a field experiment. Okay, so what I did then is I looked in the literature and tried to learn what are the best ways to use seed money. And what I learned was that this sector was filled with anecdotal evidence. People used it. University of Wisconsin's Coal Center, they raised $27 million before they went public in their drive to raise a total of $72 million. They raised $27 million in private. Fundraising schools and booklets will tell you authoritatively you should raise between 40 and 50 percent, between 20 and 50 percent. These are the right figures. And you ask, where did these figures come from? What's the underlying mechanism at work? Show me the data. In 1998, you would receive nothing. It's just a gut feeling. That's exactly what it was back then. It happened to be an interesting theory that Jim Andrioni wrote about how seed money can exclude bad equilibria in these giving games when you have a threshold public good, fixed cost. So his idea was seed money can exclude, for example, the bad equilibrium of everyone giving zero. And that in and of itself can lead to more money being raised. That's good. That's an interesting theory that we have. Same thing with refunds. What I have in mind here is that I announce we need to raise $5 million, which is beyond this particular study, but just as an, as an example, we need to raise $5 million, but if we don't raise it, we will send the check back to you. Okay. Bagnali and Lippmann have a theory in 1989 in the RE stud that uses the same solution concept more or less as what Jim used in his um, seed money paper in the QJ. It works the exact same way. You can exclude bad equilibria by using a refund. Okay, and there are also some examples of that in practice. But what am I to do? I only have one charity, and I can't deceive people and tell them I received 20% seed money in one case, 50% in another. That's against the law in experimental economics. So what am I to do? Christine, what do you think? Here's what we did. We split that capital campaign into six smaller capital campaigns, saying that we needed to raise money for computers, for SEPA, for the Center for Environmental Policy Analysis. And then in those six cells, we ran a three by two with three seed levels, 10, 33, 67, crossing with a refund, no refund treatment. Okay. And what we found in that study is that seed money worked very well. In fact, on both the intensive and extensive margins, those improved as seed money went up. I don't think this is a general result, 
but it was a result over our range. And when you look at the fact that refunds did not work well in the way that they interacted, we could reject Andreoni's theory about seed money being used as a device to exclude bad equilibria. What these particular data are more in line with is that you can use seed money to signal the quality of your charity. And since these results were published, there have been a few papers now developing theory on using seeds as a signal of charitable quality. Okay, so that was paper number one. Now, it raises uh, the question of, given you have upfront money, maybe you should use it as a match rather than just announcing that you have it. Okay, and a lot of you probably hear this on NPR. Send in your $100 now. We will match it one to one for the next hour. So your $100 will look like 200 and effectively they're trying to vary the price. They're cutting the price in half of giving. That's the idea. Okay, so that's exactly what Dan Rondeau and I were up to when we worked with the Sierra Club. And this is another mail solicitation, just like SEPA. We sent out several thousand letters to donors. The Sierra Club is the same way, sending out mail solicitations. We have a few controls. We compare seed to matching, and the match rate was one to one. And again, what we found in that particular paper is the power of seed money. Seed money did very well. Matching did slightly worse, but they were both much better than both controls. Okay, so it gives us an idea about using upfront money. Now, you can ask, that wasn't a fair test because you're using the wrong match rate. And fundraising strategists will tell you exactly what Kent Dove tells you. Never underestimate the power of a challenge gift. Obviously, a one-to-one -one match, every dollar that the donor gives is matched by another dollar, is more appealing than a one-to-two match. And a richer challenge greatly adds to the match's attractiveness. This looks like the law of what in economics? It's exactly what we say about private goods, isn't it? If you can get one Snickers bar for a dollar, that's better than one Snickers bar for two dollars. But if you can get two Snickers bars for a dollar, you're really doing well. I mean, Dove is just reminding us that the law of demand is at work here. But the question is, is that model, is a private goods model a good model for charitable fundraising? So go ahead out and look in this industry at the time and look at what people are doing, including Drake, which received $50 million, and the donor said, you need to use this to raise more money in two-to-one and three-to-one matching solicitations. But there is no empirical evidence that that is true. You ask people, where is the empirical evidence on simply looking at a match and a price effect in charitable giving? This gets at how we should be modeling charitable gifts. No evidence of that at all. In fact, the best evidence was one guy running a one-to-one -one match in July, and then he decided to run a one-to-one -one match in December. And, I mean, pardon me, a two-to-one match in December, and he found that he raised more money in December than July. So he said the match matters. We all know that December is the best time to raise money. Tax considerations, end of the year cheer. So Dean Carlin and I ended up writing this paper, on, amongst other things, on looking at match rates. Okay, so you can try to guess what this is. National liberal nonprofit in the U.S., political and socially oriented. Anybody want to take a guess? I can't tell you by the way, but I'd love to tell you. But I'll let one person take a guess. I'll let you read the reply card first, actually. They send letters to regular donors. What they're going to have us do is they're going to give us one run, one, one month to run our experiment. So we can send out roughly 50,000 letters. And we sent those out in August of 2005. And we got all this money from an anonymous donor. So this is all legitimate. What we're going to do is change the match ratio from nothing to 1 to 1, 2 to 1 to 3 to 1. Maximum amount available, 150, 25, and unstated. And there will be an example, a string, an ask string, which I'll show you on the card, of low, medium, or high. OK, so exactly how did we run this natural field experiment? This is how. By putting these cards, these reply cards, in every letter. 
Okay, so here's what the card said. Troubled by the continued erosion of our constitutional rights, a concerned member, this concerned member was trying to go after one of President Bush's um, Supreme Court nominees. A concerned member has offered a matching grant of 2550, 100 or blank, to encourage you to contribute to blank at this time. To avoid losing the fight to defend our blank, this member has announced the following match, $1, $2, $2 for every dollar you give. So for every, this is the ask string, this is highest previous contribution times one. So we looked in the last several years and took out their highest previous contribution. Highest previous contribution times 1.25 times 1.5. You give, blank will actually receive X. Let's not lose this match. Please give today. Yes? In this drive. So if you go over 25, he only gives 25. If you give 20, he should be taking five back. If in this cell that has 25, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, there's one concerned member that we'll see, we'll see has offered a matching grant of 25000 and let's say it's one to one. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes, yes, sometimes, no. Uh, we'll find that, that that dollar value here did not matter. Um, and I'm not going to take a stand on what charities really do. I can just tell you that the charities that I've worked with have been honest, and there's a real opportunity cost of a match dollar, but I'm not... I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've never heard of it happening that if you get up to 25000 the guy just says, I was just kidding. I'm not really going to give you. Because that's in the contract, and then that's given. But yes, if you, don't get, if you don't get to twenty five, he can take. That's in the contract. I don't know. We didn't, we didn't have that problem here. I know of some cases where the guy has taken it, and I know of some cases where the guy said, use it for other things at the charity. Empirically, the cap didn't matter. And what I mean by that is when I look across treatment cells that vary 25, 50, 100 blank, that did not seem to affect the way people behaved in this experiment. Okay? Yes, just. I think it matters the underlying motivations for giving. Right. And I think that gets at some of the underlying motivations of giving. Um, and I don't have any theory or, or data on, on that, but I can certainly see the, the potential problem with that. And it is, I think reference point could be an interesting consideration there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when I say price elasticity, I mean it in a very narrow sense in a particular charitable drive. Because it could be the case that they think it's a scam. They think they're going to get the money anyway. So it's, in, that, in that light, it's different from the elasticity that you get when you look at a change in the marginal tax rate. But th this is exactly the elasticity that I want, though. Right? Because I don't know if what happens in, uh, in the other literature spills over to this. But when I think about cheating, I, I think a lot about the collusive model. It's, it's almost the insights that you learn in that literature is similar to whether a charity wants to cheat the donors in this environment. I think a lot of, of those predictions would, would spill over to this particular environment about when to cheat, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, when I said cheat, I was trying to go back to Luigi because I think that's where you were going. These guys are just all cheating. That's kind of the elasticity that I want. If they are, then there should be no effect of, of match. Which we'll see if there is, actually, when I, when I go ahead, Devin. Yes, yes. What happens is when you do that, you, 
in this, the sample sizes were so large here that we didn't gain a lot in power. So we, it's harder to do that when somebody else is doing the envelopes. So it's easier to give them uniform, and the, the benefits did not exceed the cost of doing that here. But I do have that calculation in, the, in this follow-up working paper about what you'd exactly gain. You don't gain much that here. But I do wish that I would have did something else in this experiment, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about some data. If you just compare treatment versus no treatment, when I'm talking treatment, I'm, I'm talking about either 1 to 1, 2 to 1, or 3 to 1, you raise about close to 20% more money. And we're talking about, in total, I think we raised seventy five dollars or $90,000 in this drive. Okay, but where this actually comes from is interesting. This actually comes from entirely on the extensive margin. So it's the fact that more people are giving. The people who we think would be giving more, they're not giving more. In fact, the response rate increases by about 22% in the matching treatments. When you look at then across the ratios, those ratios perform about the same. Three to one and two to one are a little bit better. Not much, they're statistically the same. So this gives you a sense, now you can see what, what treatment I'm missing because I never imagined that this would happen over this particular range. So I didn't worry about doing a one to two or a one to three. Obviously this isn't gonna be a general result, but it is a result over these match ratios that are typically used and if this is a true result, a stylized fact, then you can imagine, A, that we're thinking about the model of giving in a, in a slightly wrong way, and B, charities are wasting a lot of money if they're being fair about what they're doing. Right, because the opportunity cost of a match dollar means something. Go ahead. Yeah, so I have that, right? I have give, has given 100,000, has given 50, has given 25, and has given blank. Uh, zero yeah, that's my baseline, okay. right? And then I have all, I'm crossing all those, right? Justine. Yes. The total dollars given, not including the match, the dollars given are the same across three to one, two to one, one to one. So this does not include the match money. So three to one doesn't raise less money than one to one, it raises about the same. If you included the upfront money, it would raise more, right? But there's an opportunity cost of the upfront money. In, in seed money. So the Sierra Club... Clearly you want the match, but what I just showed you with the Sierra Club, you would want that announced as somebody gave $100,000 in seed money, now we need more. That performed better than a one-to-one -one match. I'm not sure, but in all these we met we met up, so I'm not, I can't speak to, and that will be charity specific and how many letters you sent, et cetera. Okay, now what I say about general result, clearly we have done now one to two with the NAACP, and one to two outperforms one to, they perform about the same as one to one, and both do better than the control. So now going to one to two is good, but is going to one to 100 good? Likely not, right? Yes. Yeah, we did. And in this particular study, it's not. So it's not intertemporal substitution. There is now a study that has come out that has found similar results, but has found some intertemporal substitution. In, in this data set, we did not. We looked at the next year, year's worth, worth of giving. We did not find any of that going on. But to be intellectually honest, there is another study that has found some crowding out from the future.
Yes. This, this is a warm list. This was a warm list. This was not an acquisition mailer. Sometime in the last five or ten years. They don't give every month. Right. And then that's a good question about are you just moving it up a, a month? So that's why we needed to look at contributions before that period and after. And, and in ours, you, never, you didn't have... It was surprising. I thought you would, but you didn't have intertemporal substitution in our in our data. We do. Exactly. Yeah. It's a first step. Exactly. It's a first step. Now, my first guess will be that this will hold. And it has held in other types of groups. Uh, to me, it's more about religion versus non-religion. Because I think when you give to a religious cause, which is a big chunk, you're buying something different than what these other folks are buying. Uh, it's just a speculation. But I certainly agree. I don't, I don't know if there will be one silver, silver bullet in the end. There might be bins of knowledge, and then we have to think about a, an overarching theory that can help um, explain all of those data. And we're just getting started right now, but you're certainly right. For example, if you think that there is some activity in the farm and the river, yeah, of course. Yep, exactly. And the ones that don't, there'll be no match effect. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's right. I don't, that could happen. Again, my first guess will be this, and then we'll have to adjust when we get other data. Okay, so let's move on. I only have about 15 minutes here. Wow, five minutes, okay. There's other work. Um, some of you probably saw Stefano and Ulrika presenting our, our paper on door-to-door -door fundraising where we're trying, to, we're, we're trying to really dig into this idea of social pressure versus altruism in a door-to-door -door fundraising drive. We've, of course, lotteries are another thing that you can, you can contemplate in a fundraising drive. Donor gifts, of course, are interesting as well. Okay, we won't comment any further on those. Ongoing field experiments, the only thing I want to talk about here is that you know, a lot of this game is larger donors. But it's very difficult to experiment with larger donors. Why? Because the fundraisers... <laughs> Won't, won't let me near big donors, okay? I've just happened to convince a few of them now. A few universities are allowing me to name some classrooms and to run experiments on naming classrooms. So that's um, the naming rights. And there's a, a really visionary business school in the Midwest that is allowing me access to a very rich data set in which their models predict that these people can give between five, ten, twenty-five million dollars, and they have not been approached in a very long time. So I'm going to be taking some of this to them as well. So you could have, you could have said the same thing. Does it generalize to larger donors? I hope we'll find out. Right? Uh, Phonathons in a pretty cheap way that we're doing experiments with Smile Train, etc. Okay. Lessons learned. I'm going to go quickly. Smaller givers do not seem to be buying a private good when they donate. And this is hedge, smaller seam. Upfront money is important, most effectively used so far as announced seed money. Non-price incentives can have very strong effects on givers. So when you look at donor gifts, the, having a donor gift, that can actually substitute for a warm list, which is sort of an amazing result because the charities all tell you that it's always about getting a warm list, but a very small donor gift can make a cold list person look like a warm list person. But that leads to the next question that it's very critical how you initially get a person to give, the incentives that you use up front. And we talked a little bit about crowding earlier. Some types of incentives might crowd out reasons for giving later. Chari signaling charitable quality seems to stick. Okay, so let's talk about experiments of for-profits for a few moments. And I'm going to begin by talking about a Chrysler weight loss experiment. 
And this is an experiment whereby Chrysler allowed us access to all of their employees who were interested in a wellness program across their roughly 32 plants. And we went in and developed a scheme whereby there are some teams that were set up. They were anonymous teams. Some piece rate schemes. And, and some of the team mechanisms would go as follows. There are three other people on your team. You have an incentive of X, and you will be paid based on the largest uh, loser of weight in your team. That's called a best shot mechanism. Weakest link mechanism. There are three other players on your team, and your financial incentives will depend on the person who performs the worst or lo loses the least amount. Weakest link. So it has predictions on, on weight loss and effort across that setting. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've been finding, it's, it's preliminary, but there's some evidence on the team incentive schemes being very powerful and, and being very close to what theory would suggest. Chinese manufacturing plant. There's a Chinese manufacturing plant that was interested in how to give bonuses. And they produce things like big screen TVs, computers, DVD players, etc. I'm, I became interested in whether the simple frames that we find in the lab that are very important, what I mean by that, for example, is a framing a bonus is a positive versus a negative. You find very large effects in the lab. And I was very skeptical about whether that effect would manifest itself in the field over a long period of time. So we have these Chinese manufacturing plants participate in an experiment whereby we frame the bonuses as losses or gains. And we do it over a six-month period. And amazing to me, what happens is these simple framing manipulations matter a lot over the entire six-month period. The loss frame leads to roughly 1% higher productivity than the gain frame. They're both much higher than baseline roughly 3 or 4% higher than baseline. Okay, so to me, I think that shows the power of these simple ideas that behavioral economists have found in the lab can actually have real effects in the field. And Devin has a very nice paper on this with um, Tiger Woods and how he's loss averse when he's putting, although Tiger's not really because he's too experienced. Ambassadors group. This is actually combining field experiments with naturally occurring data and what we're looking at here is they allowed us to run pricing experiments. Ambassadors Group travels high school students overseas. And they allowed us a few years of running pricing experiments. And they also gave us all of their naturally occurring data. I think this came up a little bit earlier. It shows a power of combining naturally occurring data that does not have exogenous variation with data that has exogenous variation. We're pretty close to having um, a paper written. This is with Levitt. That, um, that shows a complementarity of, in this particular environment. Okay, so I would say now watch for an experiment near you. I can't tell you the airline, but there will be a major airline pricing experiment starting next Wednesday. Um, so watch for that. Um, there's a large insurance provider that's now randomizing rate quotes. Again, I can't tell you the large insurance provider, but that's going on as we speak. And then there's kind of this busy website that um, is allowing us access to some of the people who answer their phones. And we're running experience. That's where, I'm, that's where I want to end. And I, I've set up these guideposts for field experiments, you know, artifactual frame, natural field experiments. And I understand that all field experiments won't fit into one of these three guideposts. I'm, I'm just thinking about this as a way to guide our thinking about what a field experiment looks like. And I've taken it upon myself, so to speak, to have a clearinghouse of papers that in the roughly a, risen in the last 10 or 15 years that include artifactual framed and natural field experiments. And it's free on this website. You will find paper titles, authors, and a PDF version of every paper. And it's, it's free. It's just, it says .com, but I think that's for no given reason. There's no ads. This is just something that my team has put together. There are, I think, roughly three to 400 field experimental papers on this site. This isn't data, 
but at least it gives you a source to find papers that have data. And if you have a field experiment that's not on this site, please send it. There's a, there's a way to submit your field experiments to this particular site. Now, I've already argued that I see this as a high growth industry. You might be convinced, you might not be. What do I see as generation next? Exactly that last slide about working in collaboration with private firms. You see this explosion in development economics, you know, these partnerships with governments and, and NGOs, and that's, it's not surprising that there, there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm for that area. And you can understand why historically that we've gone that route. Now going this other route where firms will open up and we have to be careful, of course. I understand confidentiality in IRB. It's available and it's possible to overcome those barriers. And when you think about it, working in collaboration with firms, pro profit or nonprofit, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there. And you see this as a, as a large potential chance to learn something important about economics. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I have a few more slides, but I know that I'm... I'm 10 minutes over, so I'm going to stop there and entertain any questions if you have them, or I can, I can finish these slides. It ends on a methodological note, one of my favorite ways to end the slideshow, but I'm not going to tax you that much. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, we can call it a, a session. Otherwise, I'll entertain questions in public or private. Okay, I'll